Okay, well, we'll get, we'll go ahead and get started this evening. Thank you for joining us. It's a beautiful evening out, but I think uh, Leah's presentation is very pertinent to most of America today. As a, my name is Tiffany Rickey, and I'm a dietitian, and I've been um, granted the honor to be able to present the Healthy Living Lecture Series this summer. So um, I'm joining with you and learning every single week, so this is exciting for me. And as a dietitian, I, I totally get the whole drug-nutrient interaction and, and how potent um, drugs can be in the body system. Leah, of course, gets that a little bit more. She is a, Leah Scadden is our uh, lecturer this evening, and she will be talking about medication therapy management and how it can actually save your life. Uh, she graduated from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center with a Doctor of Pharmacy degree in 1999. Uh, it, she attained the American Pharmacists Association National Certi Certificates for Medical Medication Therapy Management Services. This is a lot of letters. <laughs> Pharmacist and patient-centered diabetes care and pharmacy-based immunization delivery in 2013. Currently, Leah is the clinical staff pharmacy, pharmacist at Fred Meyer East, and for those of you that shop there, she did survive the remodel, move, and back. Um, she's been the clinical staff pharmacist since 2013 and has staffed there since 2008. She previously worked as a pedi pediatric clinical pharmacist at Providence, Alaska Medical Center in Anchorage from 2003 to 2008. She's a member of the American Pharmacists Association and the Alaska Pharmacists Association. And aside from being a smarty pants pharmacist, <laughs> she didn't write that out either. Uh, Leah is a wife and mother, and she stays active running her two kids to school, soccer, swimming, and ballet practice. She also enjoys scrapbooking, reading, cooking, and working on mosaics. So I am pleased to introduce Leah Scadden. So thank you. Can you all hear me? Is it, is it on? No? All right, help. <laughs> you want to hold it up a little bit? Testing. Uh -huh. I apparently wore the wrong shirt. <laughs> okay, well, welcome, and thank you for spending your evening with me. So, medication therapy management, and how can it save your life? So that sounds pretty extreme, doesn't it? But in fact, it's not. Medications are there to help you. They're, they can cure infectious diseases. It can prevent problems from chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol. It can ease pain. But in order to be helpful, medications must be taken correctly and appropriately. If not, harmful reactions can possibly occur. Errors can even happen, whether it's in the hospital, the doctor's office, at home, or even in the pharmacy. There must be an appreciation of the power of medicine, the value of medications when used properly, as well as the consequences when used improperly. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, two main topics. The first one is the idea of polypharmacy and how to manage it, as well as um, I really wanted to express how important it is to create your own medication list. And uh, the second part of my lecture is to understand more about vaccines and know which ones are right for you. So polypharmacy is pretty much um, defined a number of different ways in the literature, but mainly um, it's defined as uh, anybody taking more than four medications. It's also the prescription, administration, or use of more medications than are clinically indicated. Uh, 
And polypharmacy is a growing problem seen in medicine today, especially with the increase in the number of people with chronic disease states, also with the increase in the number of medications available to treat these disease states, and also the growing elderly population. And this not only plagues patients, but also clinicians and pharmacists as well. And it's also been well documented that as the number of medications a person takes, um, as, sorry, as the um, number of medication, uh, medications a person takes goes up, the potential for drug-related problems goes up as well, such as adverse effects and also hospitalizations. And adverse medication outcomes have been estimated to be the fourth or fifth cause of mortality in hospitals. So I just kind of wanted to give you a couple examples of polypharmacy just so that you can get a better understanding. And the first one has to do with hospi hospital medication formularies. Probably all of us have been admitted into the hospital one time or another in our lives. And hospitals have medication formularies, and these are put in place um, to do a number of things, but mainly to help reduce costs um, and whatnot. But so an example that I have is when a patient gets admitted, all of their medications are looked at um, on their intake. And so say, for instance, a patient is, is um, taking a medication called Prevacid, at home, but when they go into the hospital, Prevacid isn't on their how to, on the hospital formulary, but Prolisec is. So those medications, they're in the same drug class and they pretty much do the same exact thing, but when you're in the hospital, that patient's gonna be switched to taking Prolisec. And then upon discharge, when the patient goes home, that doctor may just write their discharge medications for Prolisec not maybe understanding that the patient was switched um, when they came into the hospital. So now when the patient goes home, they're seeing, oh, I have to take this new medication called Prolisec, but I still have this Prevacid at home. And so then they end up taking two of the same medications when they're at home, not fully understanding that they're on essentially two medications, but they only need to be on one. Another example, um, sometimes patients, um, the, the more sicker patients, when they're admitted into the hospital, they'll be started on a medication called famotidine, and that is to help reduce the risk of stress ulcers developing in their stomach. And sometimes this medication may not be stopped when they leave the hospital. So again, a person may be on a medication that they don't necessarily need to be on when they leave the hospital. And then my... Um, other main example of polypharmacy is when additional medications are started to treat side effects. And um, so sometimes you're going to be on a medication, and unfortunately, medications, sometimes they just come with side effects. But sometimes patients will end up being given a whole new medication to treat that side effect. And sometimes patients, um, it might be better for a patient to be on a different medication that doesn't have such a... Um, a high side effect profile medication. As we get older, we metabolize things differently. So um, sometimes in the older population, um, there's different criteria that, that doctors and pharmacists, nurses, the whole healthcare community should look at um, what groups of medications would be better for the older population. But um, so say for instance, um, sometimes sleeping medications would be um, used to treat insomnia that are sometimes caused by um, antidepressants. Sometimes laxatives are used to treat constipation from opioid pain medications. There's um, other um, kind of a, a group of medications that are called the tricyclic antidepressants. The main one that is prescribed a lot is amitriptyline. And they use that a lot for nerve pain. They use it for sleep. They use it for a whole a uh, wide range of things. But unfortunately, in the older population, it really comes with a high risk of, of um, side effects, including constipation, urinary retention, blurry vision. So then you end up being prescribed eye drops for blurry vision, and you know it just kind of spirals out of control. So sometimes we try to curtail that and trying to hopefully get the doctor to prescribe a different medication. 
So polypharmacy has the potential to cause various outcomes, and some good, some are good, and some are bad. So the good or appropriate uses of polypharmacy may include individuals who are very sensitive to the side effects associated with a medication when the dose is increased, and these particular people may benefit from having more than one medication but at lower doses. So even though you may be on multiple medications, you'll be at lower doses so that you don't experience some of the side effects that are seen with the higher doses. And that's a totally appropriate use of polypharmacy. Um, and that way, when they're at the lower dose, um, they don't experience the intolerable side effects. And this is often seen with patients being treated with hypertension um, as well as diabetes. And um, they'll use multiple medications that provide different mechanisms of action um, just to provide a better disease state management and improve the patient outcomes. And it's not unreasonable or even uncommon to see patients who, um, say, for instance, have diabetes to be on six to nine medications just to help manage their diabetes as well as the complications that may arise from diabetes, um, such as secondary coronary events. Um, they're going to be on medication for, to help protect their kidneys, to help protect um, their pancreas. You know, it's just, it may seem like a lot, but again, it's, it's something that is backed up by um, national treatment guidelines. So some of the bad or negative outcomes of polypharmacy may include an increase in adverse events, falls, hospitalizations, costs, and all of these can decrease a patient's physical function and overall working against the patient's health. So who is at risk um, with this mainly happening? And it's, um, like I said, mainly people with multiple disease states. It's also seen with people who see multiple clinicians. And us here in Alaska, we see um, we're kind of a smaller community here, and so we see our doctors here, but if you're needing a specialist for some reason, we may need to travel to Anchorage. Some people even need to travel to Seattle. And sometimes these patients um, who are seeing multiple clinicians, sometimes those doctors aren't all on the same board. And, you know, they don't know everything um, a patient is prescribed. And sometimes there's drug interactions, there's allergy interactions, there's all different kinds of things that can happen. Um, who else is at risk are the older adults due to the fact that they're, mo they're more likely to require multiple medications to treat multiple health-related conditions. They can also experience cognitive difficulties, and this can lead to confusion with medications. And also, if you've had a recent hospitaliz hospitalization like I was talking about, um, just because when you're in the hospital, a number of medications may be started or changed or stopped, um, while in the hospital, and so your whole routine may have changed when you get out of the hospital. And why is this a problem? So this can lead to a breakdown in communication between healthcare professionals. It can also lead to disjointed care and fragmented medication lists, and also filling medications at multiple pharmacies. This can bypass the electronic safeguards that are put in place so if you're going to multiple different pharmacies, sometimes you bypass those um, safeguards and sometimes um, things can be missed, whether it's allergies, um, multiple refills for a medication, that kind of thing. And also more medication, more medication increases the likelihood of more side effects, which may result in new medications prescribed to treat these side effects like I was, like I was previously talking about. So how do you manage polypharmacy? The first step to decreasing any problem, including polypharmacy, is to consider what can be done to prevent it. So what can you do to decrease the risk factors associated with your particular disease state? So for example, if you're a patient with diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, living a healthier lifestyle with a proper diet and activity levels can help reduce the burden on these chronic conditions. And chronic conditions often lead to increases in medications. And this is one of the most important points that I wanted to stress um, to people because I just really don't see it often enough, is um, patients should keep an up-to-date and accurate medication list. And I really encourage you to use one pharmacy. You shouldn't cheat on your pharmacist. But um, 
uh, like I was talking about before, um, if you're using all these different pharmacies, um, it can bypass the electronic safeguards. And yes, I totally realize sometimes you just need to go to another pharmacy, whether someone is out of stock in a particular med medication. I totally understand that. Um, but ideally, you should try to use one pharmacy. And polypharmacy is a concern that may require an intervention called deprescribing. And this is the process of tapering off, stopping, discontinuing, or withdrawing medications with the whole, group, whole goal of improving your outcome. And I'm by no means saying just to stop these medications. This is something that should really be discussed with your doctor. Um, if you're having intolerable side effects um, or something like that, definitely bring this up to your doctor. I find a lot of patients just kind of go with the flow. And if something is really not making you feel correct um, or, you know, something is just happening in your life that is just not um, allowing you to lead the life that you want, please discuss that with your doctor. Sometimes medications be, can be changed to a different whole profile of medications, and they can really make a drastic effect in patients. And the end, and each prescribed medication should be linked to a current disease state. And I've had a number of instances where patients have brought in duffel bags like a duffel bag filled with their pill reminders, stuffed with medications, bottles that were prescribed to them years and years ago. And they come in and they say, oh, well, I knocked it off of my counter, and now I don't know where my medication should be, and I don't know. And when they pull them, put them in these pill minders, they don't know which pill is which. And it is so scary, and sometimes it's really hard to just say, how are you still living? <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> You know, it's really important that, um, you know, making sure you're on a prescribed medication that is linked to a current disease state that you're having. And if you are not on these medications, get rid of them. Just get them out of the house so that children aren't into them or anything like that. If you're not on it, you don't need it around. So you can also help prevent errors, um, mainly by knowing your medicines. You should keep a list of your medicines, and this should um, include, include the name, dose, how many times you take it, and what the medication is used for. And like I was saying before, I, I just don't see this enough. Um, and I get patients calling me and saying, oh, I just need my, my little white pill filled. Well, I don't, I don't know if you've ever really looked behind the pharmacist to see the whole array of thousands and thousands of medications that we have on the shelf but probably 50% of them are a little white pill, and we don't know what that is. So, um, but your list should definitely include over-the-counter over medications, any vitamins, herbals, um, supplements. All of these should be on your list, because just because it's over-the-counter doesn't mean that it's perfectly safe to take. There are going to be drug interactions. Nasal decongestants can increase your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is not controlled, it may not be the safest thing for you to take. There's many medications that can increase the risk of bleeding. If you're on blood thinners, this can be a problem. So please always check with us. Um, a nurse, doctor, we can all help with you. We can just do screens of your medications just to make sure um, you're being as healthy as you possibly can. Carry it at all times. Keep it in your purse. Keep it in your wallet. And I didn't add this to this, even though I should. You should also have a list of your allergies on there. Um, and take this list to each and every doctor's appointment that you go to. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely mind-boggling how all these providers don't know what a patient is on. And unfortunately, our computers are not linked together. You know, patients say, oh, I need all my current medications filled. But, you know, I can see at the pharmacy, I can see what you've most current, what you've most recently gotten filled. I can see if you have refills on something. But I don't know if something's been changed. I don't know if something has been discontinued. Um, and a lot of things, sometimes um, pharmacies these days have automatic refills where you can, you know, plug into the computer system where it will fill routinely every month. And sometimes that can be really great if you're 
mainstream and no, there's no problems, but boy, if you're having issues, you're ending up getting medications filled each month that you may not need or duplicated therapy and we may not know that. And so it, it, it helps if everybody just opens up the lines of communication. <laughs> So um, also make sure that you're reading your medication labels and following the directions. I've, I can't even express to you how many horror stories I've heard of different patients taking their medications not how they're supposed to. And I've had, just recently I had a guy call me and he said, I just prescribed this, heart, this medication for high blood pressure, but my blood pressure is still really high and I've taken three doses already and this was in the span of like 10 minutes. And I'm like... Oh my goodness! <laughs> and you know, he his blood pressure it could bottom out. He could seriously be in a lot of trouble. But um, so, anyways, um, we also want to look at the medication before you leave the pharmacy. If you're on multiple, you know, if you're on refills and everything, um, picking up your refills, um, make sure that um, the pills still look the same that you had before. Um, is it the same color, size, or shape? Sometimes it's different because it's a different manufacturer. It's the same medication. It's the same active ingredient. But sometimes at pharmacies, we're at the mercy of what the wholesaler has in stock and what they send to us. So even though it's the same medication, it may look different. But boy, patients who only know that they take that little white pill, they can be in a lot of trouble because they're just like, this is the wrong medication. And, and um, you know, sometimes it can really stress a lot of people out. So... <laughs> So, and you also don't want to take medications that are prescribed for somebody else. It's also illegal, but um, <laughs> it, it, it happens. <laughs> you also want to take extra caution when giving medications to children. They're not just little adults. Um, their medications are, are prescribed much differently than in the adult population. And this is just an example, which it's probably a little bit hard to read. Um, I just pulled this off of the internet, but you'll see that it has like a start or stop date. It has the name of the medication, the tablet strength, how to use it or when to use it, and what the medication is for. And you by no means have to find some nice pretty piece of paper on the internet to fill this in. If you do, great, but you can definitely make your own. We can print them off at the pharmacy for you. Um, and I've also had seen some patients come in where their doctor's office have printed out things um, for them just to help everything run smoothly. But again, I just don't see it often enough um, in my line of work. So. Yes, ma'am. Yes, because there's, there's plenty of interactions. Um, just for example, vitamin C, it's supposed to be a water-soluble vitamin, so you think, oh, I can't get too much of that. You can definitely get it. I, um, vitamin C causes kidney stones. I know that. I have tons of kidney stones in both my kidneys that I am pretty positive came from vitamin C, taking vitamin C on a daily basis. Now, some people, you need to be on vitamin C, especially if you're on an iron supplement. If you take them together, it helps with the absorption. But again, you know, it's, everybody is different. Everybody is patient specific. So, so, and you definitely want to ask questions. Why am I taking this medication? If you're picking up something new, definitely know why you're taking it. When do you take it? How do I take it? Do you take it with food? Do I just take it with water? Do I take it on an empty stomach? Is it going to... Um, cause any common side effects. And these are all things that you should know. All medications come with a patient leaflet that um, you should definitely be familiar with. Um, but what do you do if they do occur? Um, and when should you stop this medication? Uh, also, um, and a lot of questions that we get are, can I take this medicine with my other medications? There's food and drug interactions that are, that are quite common. So please ask us, um, and again, we can always help you with that. And if you don't know these answers, like I said, please ask us. So behind the scenes at the pharmacy. So I don't know if you're ever curious about really what happens in a pharmacy, 
Um, I guarantee you that I didn't go to school for many, many years and pay thousands and thousands of dollars in tuition just to um, pour some pills in a bottle and slap a label on it and hand it to you. <laughs> we do definitely do much more than that. On the surface, it may look like a patient just brings in a prescription and we put it into the computer and pour it in a bottle, slap a label on it, and sell it to you at the register, but we're actually doing much, much more. Um, we're also checking for, like I said, drug interactions, drug allergies, sometimes food allergies, the correct dosing, checking to see if um, the drug or dose is appropriate for a patient's age. We're checking kidney and liver function. We're also checking refill dates to assess your compliance. Have you gotten something filled? You know, you should have gotten it filled last month, but, it, but it's been three months. Are you still taking that medicine, or did you just maybe forget about it? And, you know, we run into all different kinds of scenarios. We're also complying with different state and DEA laws, cost issues, packaging issues. We're calling insurance companies all day long, um, calling doctors back, whether we can't read their handwriting or <laughs> um, many instances. Um, we're also processing prior authorizations. A lot of insurance companies, they just, they don't want to pay for the more expensive medications. So we um, call it, we're calling your doctor as well as the insurance company to get these processed through so that you can be on the medication that you do need to be on. Um, and something that the healthcare field is relying on pharmacies to do is do vaccinations. Um, so that kind of brings me to my next part of the talk, and that is vaccinations. So why am I talking to you about vaccinations? I um, think that vaccinations are just another way of keeping us healthy. I'm a firm believer in them. And every year, thousands of Americans suffer from serious health problems and even die from diseases that we can be vaccinated against. And this can include um, diseases like whooping cough, hepatitis A and B, flu, pneumonia, um, and even shingles, if you can get, if you end up getting the the more severe symptoms. So many adults and children are behind on their vaccinations, and vaccinations just don't protect yourself. It also helps to prevent the spread of disease to others in the community. It also helps to protect those who are still too young to get the vaccine. Um, there's also patients who have allergies to some components of the vaccines. And there's also those who cannot get the vaccines because their bodies are too immunocompromised from diseases like cancer. And also those who can't or won't get vaccinated, um, they can still get a benefit from herd immunity. And these diseases have not disappeared. Fortunately, the U.S. has low rates of vaccine-preventable diseases. But that's not true elsewhere, elsewhere in the world. And as we saw with just a few cases of the Ebola virus, it's just a plane ride away. Only smallpox has been totally erased from the planet, except for in some laboratories. But polio is no longer occurring in the United States, but it's still paralyzing many children in countries like Africa. And what would happen if we stopped vaccinating? We could find ourselves battling epidemics of diseases that we, thought had a, had, that we thought we had conquered years ago. An example of this is in 1974, 80% of all Japanese children were getting the pertussis vaccine. And at that time in 1974, there was only 393 cases of whooping cough and not a single pertussis-related death. But within five years, immunization rates had dropped to only about 10%. And there was over 13,000 people who got whooping cough and 41 people died from it. And then they started vaccinating again and the disease numbers dropped again. And we also saw back in December 2014, there was a multi-state measles outbreak in um, California at Disneyland. And Fairbanks um, also just saw its first measles case and we haven't had one in over 10 years. So the first one that I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to mainly talk about um, vaccines that are geared more towards the older population. So the first one I'm going to talk about is shingles. And um, 
Shingles is caused by the same virus that causes chickenpox. So if you've had chickenpox before, that virus stays in your system, and years later, it can potentially cause shingles later in life. It's a painful skin rash, often accompanied with blisters. It typically appears on one side of the face or body or in a dermatome. And typically, this rash can last for two to four weeks. But uh, one in five patients can experience severe pain long after the rash clears up. And this can happen for months to years. I have a number of patients who have um, what's called post-herpetic neuralgia, and they're on pain medications from just horrible nerve pain that they experience from shingles. So um, symptoms of shingles can also be fever, headache, chills, upset stomach, pneumonia, hearing difficulties, blindness, encephalitis, or death. And um, the shingles vaccine, it's a single dose that's approved for adults 50 years and older. Um, it's just a one-time dose. It's a subcutaneous shot that's given in the back of the arm. Um, and this can reduce the risk of shingles by 50%. You can also, 50% um, doesn't really sound like a lot, but um, it can also help reduce the pain in people who still get the shingles virus at, even after they get vaccinated. So I found some pictures of diff these different disease states that I'm going to talk about, and my husband wanted me to say that they're pretty gruesome. <laughs> so be warned. So this is um, a shingles rash in somebody, and you can see how it's only on one side of his body, so in one dermatome. And this is a patient that has shingles on his face, and he is at a huge risk of becoming blinded from this. Yes, ma'am. Can you get shingles? You have shingles. Can you get it again? And if so, would it be a good idea to get a shot against it? Yes, you can potentially get shingles again, and I would get a vaccine. There are um, um, kind of regulations on um, if you have had shingles, you should wait a certain amount of time before you get a vaccine. And um, the shingles vaccine is a live virus, so you, there's um, different stipulations. So you can't have another vaccine like in the previous month that you get the shingles vaccine. Um, since it is a live virus, if you're immunocompromised in any way, if you're a cancer patient, that kind of thing, um, that's something that the pharmacist and the doctor really have to discuss to see um, if you're well enough to get the vaccine because by golly, I, I wouldn't want to give you a shot and give you shingles, essentially. <laughs> so um, my sister-in-law is actually kind of an oddball case, and she's younger than I am, but she has chronic shingles. And it's only a little bit, but she still has chronic shingles, and anything that just kind of stresses her body, she'll get an outbreak of it. And she's is the only one I have ever heard of this. And I was like, are you sure that's shingles? And and she's like, yes, they've cultured it over and over just to make sure. So she's kind of a, an, an oddball case, but, but yes. All right, so the next vaccine I'm going to talk about is the Tdap, and that's the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. And so the tetanus, this is lockjaw, and it's a painful tightening of the muscles in the head and neck so that you can't open your mouth um, or swallow. Sometimes you can't even breathe. And tetanus will still kill one out of ten people, even with the most, um, even with um, patients receiving the best medical care, you can still die from it. Tetanus enters the body through cuts, scratches, or wounds. Um, so diphtheria, uh, probably you you just hardly ever see some of this stuff anymore. Um, but diphtheria causes a thick coating to form in the back of the throat, and it can lead to breathing problems, heart failure, paralysis, and death. And pertussis is probably one that we're maybe a little bit more familiar with, um, but that's your whooping cough, and that causes severe coughing spells, difficulty breathing, vomiting, rash, um, sleep disturbances, weight loss, incontinence, and rib fractures. Um, this can also lead to pneumonia as well as death. Um, it's especially the most dangerous in children, 
And um, diphtheria and pertussis are spread from person to person through um, coughing and sneezing. And um, adults are typically the carriers of pertussis. We may not really um, experience it, but we could sure pass it on to little kids. So if you have grandbabies around, that kind of thing, you should always make sure that you are at least um, vaccinated against pertussis. So and since vaccination began, case reports of tetanus and diphtheria have dropped by almost 99%, um, and then by about 80% of, uh, for pertussis. So you should get a tetanus booster about every 10 years. Um, and if you can't recall if you've had the Tdap with the pertussis, it's totally fine to get it. Yes? Uh, you said uh, a tetanus booster is recommended every 10 years. Yes. Should that just be the tetanus or the Tdap? So if you, what the recommendations are is if you're due for a tetanus booster, go ahead and get the Tdap. If you, because the Tdap came out in 2005, so we're still in the process of, of vaccinating a lot of people um, with the Tdap so they can get that booster of pertussis. Um, but if you, you know, we're, we're kind of, we've kind of reached that 10 year point if people got it back in 2005. Um, so if you've had the Tdap before, then you can just get the, the tetanus component, the TB booster. Does that make sense? So, um, and like I said, um, Tdap is, or I'm sorry, pertussis um, is especially dangerous for the little kiddos, especially if they're 12 months and younger. Um, anybody who is working in the healthcare community should have, um, should be vaccinated. So healthcare workers, anyone having um, close contact with babies. And it's also recommended, they just changed this not too long ago, any um, pregnant woman with each pregnancy, she should get a Tdap. Um, so even if she is um, pregnant every year, she is supposed to get a Tdap every year because that pertussis components protects her, her child. So um, let's see, back in April of this year, there's still, we still get pertussis outbreaks and um, like down in Nanana this past April, their elementary school was closed because there is, um, I think, 12 um, pertussis cases that happened. And so you end up seeing a, a flux of people getting vaccinated for it. So, and um, if I could just plead with you, if you know that you have this, please don't go walking through Fred Meyer exposing everybody. <laughs> we had... Um, We've had a couple of instances where um, doctors send over prescriptions and they'll write on it, you know, positive for pertussis, unvaccinated children, or, you know, something to that extent. And so they're letting us know. And boy, 10 minutes later, here they come waltzing through the, <laughs> the whole store, exposing everybody. And it's like, oh, go through the drive through please. <laughs> but it's, um, it happens. So, um, so anyways, this is um, a picture of a gentleman with pertussis, and you can really see how his, his neck and jaw is just um, really rigid. And this is what pertussis looks like. You can really see a, that thick white coating in the back of the throat, and it's really swollen. And I'm hoping that this works. So that is what pertussis sounds like. Healthy, right? <laughs> but that is, that's the definite um, pertussis whooping cough sound that um, is highly distinguishable. So now I'm going to talk to you about influenza. Um, most of us are fairly... Um, we uh, fairly know uh, quite a, probably a bit more about influenza. Um, it's a contagious disease that spreads typically through the winter time, usually between October and May. And it's um, caused by uh, coughing, sneezing, close contact. Mm -hmm. And symptoms include fever, chills, sore throat, muscle aches, fatigue, cough, headache, runny or stuffy nose. Um, those that are 
at risk of becoming much sicker are the younger children as well as the older population over 65, those that are pregnant, um, those with health conditions like heart and lung um, disease, kidney disease, any kind of weakened immune system, you're at more risk of developing the more severe complications from influenza. And every year, thousands of people in the United States die from influenza, and many more are hospitalized. So the flu vaccine, it's, the, um, it's not perfect, I know that, but it's the best protection that we have against the flu. And it also helps um, prevent the flu from spreading from person to person. After you get the vaccine, it takes about two weeks for your protection to develop. And um, the vaccination, it'll last for several months um, to a year, about six months or so of the year. And each year, uh, the flu vaccine is made to protect against three or four strands of the virus that are likely to cause disease that year. And like I said, flu vaccine cannot prevent all cases of flu, but again, it's the best defense that we have against it. So I highly recommend getting your flu shot every year. Um, there's many different kinds of flu shots, and um, there's like a trivalent and a quadrivalent. There's a um, nose spray that I get my son, because boy, will he fight me tooth and nail <laughs> um, to get him a poke. But um, there's also ones that are formulated without the egg protein if you have egg allergies. Um, there's cost, there's ones that are um, cost differences as well as age differences. And um, also for the, for the older population, if you're 65 and older, there's a special flu vaccine made just for you. It's called the flu zone high dose. And it has um, four times the amount of antigen as the regular flu shot. And um, as we get older, our immune systems wane. And this just kind of builds up a higher immunity for you to get. So um, it's also covered by Medicare Part B. When you have these uh, flu, uh, when you have these special sessions where people can get flu shots, do they, if you're over 65, do they have flu zone HD? Yes, we. So you have to ask for that. Yes. Should they give it to you automatically? I, I, I would. I don't say we do it automatically, but we, we really try to. If you're 65 and older, we, we really me recommend that you get the high dose, high dose flu vaccine. Yes. All right. So now I'm going to talk to you about pneumonia, and um, individuals between 19 and 64 years old who have some kind of lung disease, if they smoke or have asthma, they should be getting a, a dose of. Um, pneumonia vaccine. Um, also, anyone, when you, you know, if you've gone to the doctor and say, oh, you're 65, you should go get your flu, your pneumonia vaccine, um, that's when it's recommended again is when you're 65. Now, the recommendations have recently changed. You may, may, may or may not have heard of these, but there's now two pneumonia vaccines. One is the, pneumo, the Pneumovax, which if you've gotten the pneumonia vaccine, this is the one that you've probably gotten. Now the recommendations um, are to add the Prevnar 13 vaccine. Um, pretty much the rule of thumb that we go through um, at the pharmacy is to wait basically a year. The reason behind that is for you to get a better immune response and also um, Medicare will pay for one Pneumovax and one Prevnar if you're 65 and older, but they will only pay for them a certain amount of time away from each other. It, yeah, it gets crazy, so, but we can always look into that. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's recommended that you just get, um, so with the, if you've gotten your Pneumovax, but you were younger than 65 years old, and then you turn 65, you should be getting another Pneumovax, but five years after your first one. If you have not gotten a Pneumovax, when you turn 65, you should get the Prevnar a year later, get the Pneumovax. 
if you've <laughs> gotten a Numavax some years ago, but it's been over a year, get your Prevnar. If you turn 65, get the Numavax again. We can totally discuss all this <laughs> if you come to the pharmacy. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a little mind-boggling, but... Um, so, so. Is it an annual booster? No, it's, it's, it's pretty much um, after you're 65, it's a one-shot deal oh, for each. <laughs> Not with the recommendations. I have had some people come in and say, my doctor is really recommending me get, you know, a pneumonia shot every five years. I don't really think it's going to hurt you, but... Um, I, you know, I, I, I can just tell you what the recommendations are. <laughs> so this is uh, just an illustration of what happens in pneumonia. So up at the, the top circle, this is what your normal air sacs look like, your normal alveoli, and then in pneumonia, they'll, um, they'll start filling up with fluid. So it can be very painful and definitely hard to breathe, and um, coughing up all that stuff can be very difficult. So I'm just going to talk briefly about hepatitis B and hepatitis A. Um, hepatitis B, it's a serious infection that affects the liver. Each year, about two to 4,000 people die in the United States from cirrhosis or liver cancer. Uh, hepatitis B can cause um, either a short-term or a long-term infection. And people who are chronically infected, they can still pass the virus along, even if they're feeling totally healthy and not showing any signs or symptoms. So the hepatitis B virus is easily spread through contact with blood or other bodily fluids from an infected person. Um, and I'm kind of a germaphobe, and when I was reading this, I got really creeped out, but it, uh, people who are infected with, who can, people can be infected from contact from the hepatitis B virus that's on a surface, and it can live on a surface um, for up to seven days, and that just, that just gives me the heebie-jeebies, but anyways. <laughs> so those that should be vaccinated, um, probably more for this population. If you are six, a little bit younger than 60 um, and you have diabetes, I would definitely recommend it. You know, you're checking your blood all the time. The doctors are probably drawing more blood samples. It's, it's just a good idea. I personally think that everybody should be vaccinated against hepatitis B because why not? <laughs> The, the effects that can happen from getting this virus are just, just so outweigh the risk of, of getting the vaccine. But um, also, if you're doing any kind of international traveling, um, it can be recommended with um, different places that you're going. So again, it's just something that I recommend. Typically, it's a three-dose series given at zero, one, and six months. So again, if you're doing some international travel, it's a good idea, good idea to uh, plan a little bit beforehand if you are wanting to get vaccinated and have the full course of therapy. So this is jaundice that's caused by hepatitis, and jaundice is a yellowing. It affects the bilirubin in your system, and it can um, just cause yellowing of the skin and eyes because um, you're just you're having just your your liver is not functioning well at all when this happens. So with hep Sorry. With hepatitis B, if you had the series, you're good. You're good. You don't yes. Need Correct. Now, you can always have a titer done. Like when I started working at Fred Meyer, they're like, oh, you're going to give shots. You have to, you're a healthcare professional. You need to make sure you're vaccinated against hepatitis B. Well, I didn't want to go through a whole new series of vaccine, so I just had my doctor draw a titer, and I was fine. To get the, the maximum benefit, yes. So hepatitis A, again, is another serious liver disease. Um, this is found in the stool of infected people. So this is the one that you hear about uh, maybe in some restaurants, that kind of thing, that it can be spread by eating contaminated food or water. Um, so you always want to make sure you're washing your hands before and after you're eating. So um, it causes a flu-like illness. Uh, it, again, it can cause that jaundice that you saw previously, uh, severe stomach pains, and diarrhea. Um, those that should be vaccinated, it's very similar to the hepatitis um, B population, um, but um, kind of um, 
A different little bit of a population are um, people who are planning to adopt a child or care for a newly arrived adopted child from a country where hepatitis A is common, such as Central or South America, Mexico, Asia, Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, they should also get vaccinated. So it's a two-dose series that's given six months apart. And also the hepatitis A and B um, vaccine, these can also be combined into one shot given in a three-dose series as well. I have heard that. So if you're um, traveling like in the bush in Alaska, sometimes it can be um, recommended depending on where you're going to get vaccinated against hepatitis A. It's a, again, it's one of those things that why not, you know, and if you're ever interested if, in the vaccines, but you're not sure if your insurance pays for it or not, let us run a test claim and we'll tell you right then and there if your insurance pays for these. And the three dose series, is it over a year's time span then? It, no, it's, it's again given at zero, one, and six months. So, and I wasn't really going to talk about the MMR, which is the measles, mumps, and rubella, but then... I have a question on that because just recently I've been seeing some ads that people are saying that they're going to get the MMR vaccine and they're going to get the measles and the mumps and the rubella So there is not a vaccine against hepatitis C. There's a hepatitis A, B, C, and I'm not sure if there's more, but um, there's not a vaccine against hepatitis C, but they have come out with these new, wonderful, extremely expensive <laughs> medications um, to help treat hepatitis C. And from the reports that I've been reading is these medications are so wonderful that their vaccine load in some of these patients that they're seeing is, is almost none. So it's, they're considering almost, in a sense, a cure. Are the symptoms pretty much the same and the, and the cause of, or the relatable? Yeah, you know, it's, I, yeah, with the hepatitis C, getting it is, you know, um, the sharing of bodily fluids, um, illicit drug use, you know, all that kind of thing that can, um, the multiple sex partners, all that kind of thing that, that the virus can be spread. And, and if anybody in your household has this disease, you just, uh, it's a good idea to be, um, any of the household members should be vaccinated against hepatitis A um, or B. Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, you're, you're living with your sister, she has it type of thing, you should be vaccinated against it. And you want to do things, you know, don't be sharing toothbrushes or even razors in the shower because it's, it's a potential to spread the, the virus. So, yes, ma'am. Is that hepatitis B is in dog or B is in baby? Um, the two vaccines that I talked about are hepatitis A is in apple and B is in boy. And then she was asking about hepatitis C is in cat. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so like I said, um, an adult with recent travel to Central Asia developed measles. Fairbanks uh, had their first um, measles case that we've seen in the past 10 years. So measles is a highly infectious viral respiratory disease, and it spreads via the airborne route um, and direct contact with respiratory secretions. And just simply being in the same room as somebody with measles is enough to get um, the disease. It, it, it's one of the most virulent um, diseases that you can get. So symptoms are um, a fever up to 104 degrees, runny nose, cough, red eyes, and sore throat, and it's followed by a rash that typically starts like on the face um, and in the hairline, and then it kind of travels down. And maybe you've seen a lot of measles, but a lot of, um, a lot of doctors these this day and age, they don't see it. It could be totally misdiagnosed almost just because we don't see it a lot. Um, 
So um, the incubation period, it st typically starts to appear about 8 to, t in, um, 8 to 12 days after exposure, and the rash typically onsets about 14 days. And the infectious period is four days before the rash even starts. So you maybe think you're sick, but not know you have measles. And you could be infectious because the rash hasn't even started. And that's one of the reasons why measles can just um, run rampant. So, and then you're also infectious for four days, at least until after the rash onset. So, and like I said before, if you think you have it, just definitely don't go into hugely populated areas. <laughs> call, um, you know, you're supposed to call the doctor's office first and they'll more than likely send somebody out to see you versus you going to an area and potentially exposing people. So if you were born prior to 1957, you're pretty much presumed immune because you were probably more than at one time or another exposed to the live virus. And then adults born during or after 1957, if you don't have any evidence of immunity against measles, then you should at least get one MMR booster dose. I have been giving um, MMR at the pharmacy, not as much as I was expecting, which I think is hopefully good. <laughs> but um, so, and then. I was born in 49, and to volunteer at the hospital, they, they want you to either have a shot or a test. They tested me, and I was not immune. Yes. So I had to have an MMR. So that's true, but not completely true. Correct. And even when I. Um, so I was living down in, I went to pharmacy school in Colorado, and then I moved to Wyoming, and then from Wyoming I moved to Anchorage. And before I started working at Providence Hospital, I, I was one of the pediatric clinical pharmacists, so they were making darn sure that I had um, my MMR up to date and everything. And so they drew a titer, even though I had um, documentation that I've had my MMR. And I even, I can't recall which component it was, but I, I wasn't immune to one of the components. And then they gave me an MMR, and now when they draw titers, I'm immune to all three. But, so, yes, and, you know, and people can get all up in arms about, oh, these anti-vaxxers and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it, in reality, it just may not make a difference. Some people don't seroconvert. So, yes, ma'am. I was born in 47, and when I was junior in high school, Rubella was an It, it's all different. And I don't have any record of having an MMR. Should I get one, do you think? So I... I imagine I got one at some point. But I don't have any record. Right. And um, you can always ask your doctor to draw a titer. Okay. Um, and then, you know, or you can... You can come in and get a booster. It's, you know, either or. When I talked to the health department, they were saying, you know, if you, if you really don't have documentation but you think you were exposed, then they're erring on the side of caution and come in and get a, a shot. So. Would they have given three separate vaccines in the old days? I don't think so. I think it's always been in MMR. Um, yes. Will a title show all of your immune immunity? So I know when they drew a titer on me, they, they looked specifically for the rubiola, mumps, and rubella. So I don't know. I, I would imagine you would have to ask for them to draw for Multiple. Yeah. Okay. We don't know what a titer is. <laughs> <laughs> so you basically go in for a blood draw, and they'll draw a tube of blood from you. And um, however they do it, they, they, they're looking at like they the antigens and your immunity to the blood, but it's it's essentially just going in for a blood draw. Where does the word come from? How do you spell it? Um, titer? Yeah. T-I-T-E-R? Okay. Okay. Um, but again, I... No. Okay, so, um, and just briefly, mumps is... Um, particularly when you would see that it's, it's the inflammation of the salivary glands, um, and it is extremely painful. Um, and then rubella is the German measles, or sometimes they call it the three-day measles. It may not be as severe as the typical measles that you would see, but um, the rubella is the one that is most um, 
detrimental to pregnant women. It could cause her to have a miscarriage or um, her baby could be born with serious birth defects. So this is typically what um, measles looks like. And then this is mumps, just with a really swollen salivary gland. And then, so on the left, this is rubella, the German measles. But to me, that rubella and the rubiola, or the measles, is, and this is roseola. Um, there is no vaccine for roseola, but it, it's, it's kind of a, a childhood one. Sometimes you'll see it go through daycare centers, but they all look pretty darn thing to me. <laughs> yeah. But it looks very severe. Is there a gradation to where some kids will be sent to There, There is. When I was, you know, looking at pictures and stuff, there's all, all kinds of um, severity, and some of the rashes will be really itchy, some of them won't, and that kind of thing. So um, this is just... I know this is hard to read. This is just the 2015 recommended immunizations for adults, um, and it's based on age. Typically, if you're like um, 65 and older, pretty much this is just saying um, get your yearly flu shot, get at least one dose of the Tdap. Um, if you're over 60, uh, get your shingles. Actually, in the state of Alaska, shingles is approved for 50 and above. It's just that some people's insurances may not pay for it when you're 50. They will sometimes make you wait till you're 60, like Fred Meyer insurance. Um, but again, if you're ever interested, we can always run a test claim and let you know if your insurance um, will pay for it or not. I'd like to make a point about that. You really have to pay for it. Take my word for it. After having the shingles, it gets worth the 200 or whatever it costs. Thank you. <laughs> it's, really, it's really worth it. Yeah, so I, I had... Um, I got um, bronchitis not too long ago, but um, I um, I could have sworn it was pneumonia, and I really wish I could just get a pneumonia shot. <laughs> but with my age, they're like, well, you don't recommend it. I'm like, I don't care. I just want it. <laughs> so um, briefly, I just wanted to um, talk about what we offer at Fred Meyers. And of course, we will fill your prescriptions for you. Um, we also offer these MTM services, and MTM stands for Medication Therapy Management. And some people might know them as like a, a brown bag event where um, we did these a lot in pharmacy school where we would get people bringing in all their medications that they have, everything that they're taking or not taking, put it in a brown bag, bring it to us, and we sit down with you and we go through everything. We look at drug interactions, making sure you know what the medication is used for, um, are you experiencing really bad side effects? Um, are there any holes in your therapy? You know, if you're, if you're a patient who is diabetic, um, you should probably be on a medication for cholesterol as well just to help prevent these um, potential outcomes that can happen, um, the coronary syndromes that can happen. Um, you know, we just kind of sit down and see if there's any issues that we can um, look at, um, making sure that you're on a medication that is that you have a clinical indication for, basically. So we also do screening services. Um, I can check blood pressures. I can check your blood glucose. Um, if you're a diabetic, I can also check your A1C. And, you know, most people think that you can only get this done at your doctor's office. It's a very quick finger poke. I can, um, I can do A1C. Um, your BMI is your body mass index. Um, I can also check cholesterol panels. We have um, a machine that um, it's just a finger stick, and um, we can show it, check your cholesterol panel. I also do coaching services for diabetes management and um, care. Um, F and W stands for fitness, nutrition, weight, and heart healthy is more for um, hypertension and cholesterol issues, and I also do smoking cessation. Again, we do all immunizations as well as travel consults, so we'll do, if you're traveling the world, we can do Japanese encephalitis, rabies, typhoid, polio, we can do everything but yellow fever, but that's going to be changing. <laughs> so. It's a mosquito-borne illness, but it's um, it's only seen like in certain countries. But 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's a mosquito-borne illness. Um, Maybe. I've only given it once. I have to reread it. <laughs> but it's yes, yes. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's different. Um, but it's you know we can always take a look, um, see where you're traveling, and if it's recommended because it's recommended in some areas but not others. So we can so I can do travel consults. Um, I know in town at certain doctor's offices, they'll charge you about $240 just to do a travel consult. Our fee is $50, um, but you know, if you even want to hop on the CDC website, you can, you can check, you know, you can put in your itinerary and see which vaccinations that you should get and maybe 50 bucks. So, <laughs> so it's, um, but again, I, you know, call me up, we can always discuss it. So. Uh, let's see, we also do diabetic food tours, and this is a new thing that we're doing. We just had our first one uh, a few months ago, but they're led by a dietitian, and it's basically if you have diabetes or even somebody with diabetes in your family, uh, we uh, do an overview of diabetes, but then we um, walk the food aisles, and it's patient-led, and they ask questions of the dietitian, finding out what is a better bread, how to count carbohydrates, that kind of thing. Um, and we got really good reviews from it, so we're, we're waiting to do our next one. So, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the um, Fairbanks Health Department. They do all childhood vaccinations up into 18, um, but for adults, I know vaccinations can potentially cost a lot of money. I know that. My goal is for you to get what you need to make you as healthy as possible. So, um, the Fairbanks Health Department, they will do um, adult vaccinations, but only some. They will do the Tdap, um, they will do the tetanus, and they'll do the Pneumovax, but they don't do the new Prevnar. And then they will only do shingles for ages 60 to 64, something with their grant, that's only what they're able to vaccinate for. And they also do the HPV vaccination, which, which is the human papillomavirus one, um, but it's only it's it's only for that age group, which is like to 26 years old or something. So um, the cost at the Fairbanks Health Department it's 27.44 for your first vaccine, and then $15 for each additional vaccine. So if you're really strapped for cash and you fit within these parameters, by all means, go see them at the Fairbanks Health Department. They are very very wonderful there. So. The Tdap is the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Okay. So these are just my takeaways. Um, and the biggest piece of information that I want you to take away from this is just know the potential hazards of polypharmacy and how to help manage it. Um, also keeping a current list of your medications with you that you take with um, you to each and every doctor's appointment. Um, and again, that should include your allergies, name, dose, how you take it, and what it's used for. And then also knowing which vaccines are right for you. And you can also go to the CDC website. That website is pretty phenomenal. You can take like a little test where you um, plug in your age and gender and answer a few questions about your lifestyle and health conditions, and it'll pop out what, rec what recommended vac vaccinations um, you should get. So, and again, if you're ever curious, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist, and we can always go through that. Even if you don't have a record of your vaccinations, probably getting an extra one is not going to hurt you. So, and again, um, just one of the most important things is just help us help you and be active in your own health care ask questions and be an informed consumer because um, the most important person in your health care is you. So, so, any additional questions? <laughs> Sorry, I know I run a little bit over and I tried to pare it down, but apparently I can really talk. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, this concerns medications. Uh, if you're traveling specifically out of the country and your medications are you know, expired or they've been lost or stolen or damaged or something like that, 
are the names of the medications pretty much standardized, and how would you go into a, a foreign pharmacy and say, I need this? Help. Um, <laughs> so medications are not the same. Like, um, I don't know if it's Canada or in Europe, like acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, it goes by paracetamol. Um, it's one of the fairly more common ones that I know of, but um, I would definitely, now there's, but there's references that we can pull up online. I'm assuming they can also do that there, um, that can, you can look for um, medications that are out of your country or, um, I'm trying to think of the word that I'm trying to say, but, but there's, there's references that you can look up, like, okay, I'm on this, what is your version of it? And there, there, there are ways to, to look at that, and, um, you know, I try to at least go to a hospital or a pharmacy and see, you know, there's a ton of medications that, are, that you can buy at a pharmacy elsewhere that you can't buy here, so um, they may be able to, to definitely get you what you need. Or something hopefully similar. <laughs> Would you need a, a doctor's or pharmacist's permission from this country to be valid in another country? Or do you know how that works? Like here in the United States, we, we cannot take um, prescriptions from elsewhere, from out of the country. So it's. It's easier in other countries to get medications that you need in Boston. Right, like, I mean, in Canada, you can get muscle relaxers over the counter. You can get all kinds of stuff over the counter. Well, and you can talk to the pharmacist. Yeah. They're very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And they will you know, contact you and yep. they look at the ingredients then of what you, you know, are taking. Right, and I would, you know, I would say try to go to, like, a, a hospital type of place. Um, With national health in a lot of the countries, they... Right. The pharmacies are pharmacies. They're not the drugstore that they make up. Yeah, right. Correct. And like I know in, down in Mexico, I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. You just walk right across the border and you're in Juarez, Mexico. And boy, you can go to the pharmacies. You can get antibiotics. You can get, they may go by a different name, but it's, it's you know, you can, you can get a lot more <laughs> that's essentially over the counter that the pharmacist will, will get you that, that you couldn't get here in the state. So, but I would definitely, when you're traveling, make sure you keep those on your, your carry-ons. Don't put it in your luggage. Yeah, so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Recently, uh, fairly recently, we've had an influx of people and children, children, thousands of people that have come into this country, and nobody knows what they've had or what haven't had. What is being done? Do you know about this? I, I don't know exactly what is being done. Do you know anything, Tiffany, at all? Uh, that I'm not. Yeah. That's a very good question. Yeah, I, I would hope that, you know, some kind of, it's government regulated at all. <laughs> but, but again, I, I don't know for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Sometimes if you get behind there, skip something uh, and they say, um, when you finally get a prescription refill, and you skip, say, two or three days, my impression is that you're supposed to take almost those two or three days almost and catch up. In other words, not just uh, wait. Right? No, I, I would not. If you missed three days of medications, um, especially like diabetes medication, I wouldn't take, you know, three pills of metformin. You're going to bottom out your blood sugars. So I would start, um, you know, you shouldn't double up on a medication. Take it as soon as you remember, but don't double up on a medication. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I, I talked to Leah, oh my goodness, was this back in September or October to do this yes. presentation? <laughs> because as a dietitian and working in the hospital, the list of medications, and I, I mean, I have to take a few medications and just knowing that my Synthroid has to be on an empty stomach before I eat, 
you know, I have to take it every day, my refills, and that's just, those are two medications. And, and I can't imagine having more than that. And the scary reality of what can happen if you forget to take a medication. And so I'm so thankful for your advice. And just that medication sheet, I mean, we get prescribed medications and we trust that the doctor knows what they are for us. But when you have multiple medications, it's important that you that you know what they are, what they do, what mm -hmm. they look like. Um, and if you're, my husband is notorious. Well, I know that it's almost expired, but we should keep it just in case. And yeah. just say, no, no, no. <laughs> no. If it's expired, throw it away. Yeah. And, I, and, and just a little blurb on getting rid of your medications if you don't use them or they're expired. Some people here... Um, you know, a number of people, they're just like, no, I don't want to flush it down the toilet because of the fish or, you know, and that is hunky-dory, fine and dandy. Um, <laughs> what you should do is if you have coffee grounds or kitty litter, get your medications that you aren't using, grind it up, mix it with something like kitty litter or coffee grounds that makes it unappealing to somebody digging through your garbage, and then put it in a sealed baggie and then you just throw it away. That is typically what you're supposed to be doing. They also have yeah, drug Yeah, drug tape backs. Now, yeah, um, I, yes, but I, I am not positive on this, but I, I don't know if they're doing that anymore. I really heard it And which is a complete shame. Um, the prescription center pharmacy has a bin that you can some of the, oh, really? a new service and some of the pharmacies are subscribing to it. It's a take back. It's a, and it, then it's in a sealed container and it's sent to a company that does those reverse outfits. Yeah, and I know we sell these bags. Yeah, I we sell these bags that you can put them in and seal it up and then I think it's even free shipping and ship it off to somebody. But I but. think the coffee grounds and the kitty litter idea is better. You can just put it all and then put it in a Ziploc and then put it in with the rest of your stinkiest garbage mm -hmm. yeah. and all <laughs> those kinds of kids smell up. And then yeah. the other thing, I, you know, I'm a pharmacist too, so I really appreciate what you said. And the most important thing that for me is get your prescriptions in one pharmacy, please. Because we don't, we talk to each other, I'll talk to Leah, but my computer's not talking right, to her. Right, right. So I don't have a record. When I was working, I didn't have a record of what you had filled mm -hmm. at, at Fred Meyer, Safeway, and at the emergency room. The right. Pharmacy. So it's really important. That list is great. That's the best thing of all. But just get everything filled in one place and figure out which is the most convenient or the best for your particular. If you shop at Fred Meyer all the time, that's the best place or safe way. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's every one of us wants to have all of them. Wants to have, and it's really best to keep, you know, everything in one spot. Yeah, and yeah. That list. That's Perfect thing. Yes, ma'am. So, do any doctors not approve of you changing to generic when they become available? They will specify, like they'll put a DAW, which means dispenses written. There's a few eye doctors that they really want um, certain particular brand name eye drops, or uh -huh. it's it's pretty rare. We have a we have some patients on like their duragesic um, pain patches, and by golly, they have to have brand name on all their pain meds. Um, they can't have generic, and they they'll raise a huge stink if they don't uh, get brand name. But it's um, you know we see it with classes of of drugs, but doctors for the mar for the most part they don't really mind. Um, but so yeah. Well, your insurance comes. Yes, right. Insurance comes. If there's a generic available, your insurance wants to pay for the generic. They don't want to pay for the brand. Yeah, I'm also on Synthroid, and I have to take yes the brand. Yeah. Now there are certain class. 
Right. There are certain right. There are certain drugs that, by golly, if you are on the brand, stay with the brand. And those would be things like Coumadin, the blood thinner. But if you take Warfarin, then stick with Warfarin. If you're on Synthroid, stay with Synthroid. Because if you're flip-flopping back and forth, that can have a tendency to mess with your INR or your levels. Um, what's another one? Yes. Um, yes, yes. And sorry. <laughs> so. If you take more than one medication, it would be very helpful if medications were sold like either in 90 pill size containers instead of some come with 90, some come with 100. So you can't keep them together because if you want them refilled together, all of a sudden, you know, you're getting them too soon for the one prescription. Right. So, so here's the deal with that. Some certain doctor's offices will either write for 30 pills, they'll write for a month supply with 11 refills for your year, or they'll write for 90 tablets plus three refills for a year. Now, at a pharmacy, we can only, um, we can only bill an insurance company what that prescription says. If, you're, if we're going to bill it to insurance, um, if your doctor wrote it for 90 tablets, we will um, put it in, we will charge the insurance company essentially for 90 tablets. And then they'll send us back a reject saying, well, our plan only pays for 30 pills. So then we change it to 30 pills if you want it on insurance. Now, if the doctor writes for only 30 tablets, even though your insurance company will pay for a three-month supply, it's, an, it's insurance fraud if we change that to 90 if the prescription is not originally written for 90 tablets. It's something that is so minute and so ridiculous, but it's insurance fraud. <laughs> and so if we get audited and we've billed them for 90 tablets, but the prescription is only written for 30, we'll get humongous fines. So it's, yeah, so we will, we encourage doctors and patients um, to, you know, gosh, just write for those 90 tablets, you know, and, and we'll take it from there. We will bill it for 90, but if even if your insurance company only allows a 30-day supply, then okay, we'll fill it for 30, but for those patients who allow a 30, a 90-day supply, you know, please just let us do that. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's just, it's something that's so little, but it really affects a lot of patients, if you can just... Yes, I agree. <laughs> Is the use of NextMed MD pretty, pretty common? I, I order my pills and I remind them I want 90 days when I ask for... A Is that something through your doctor's office? It's kind of like in bank Oh, it's and like where you can send them emails and stuff you like... send an email to your doctor. I, yeah, and, and I'm military, and so and I know that that is coming about where it and it it's makes it much easier for patients. You know, if you just have a question for the doctor's nurse, you know, or something like that, you could just shoot them off an email versus yeah. making a phone call and waiting three days for them to finally call you back. And by golly, you think you have trouble getting hold of your doctor? We do it all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes. Uh, I had a funny situation where. Mm -hmm. And I went to get it filled, and the price was just incredible for 90 days. It was like $120. But the people that I admire took uh, it, it getting me a 30 day prescription and it was cheaper to fill. Mm -hmm. So I can go in and get it 30 days at a time. Yeah, it, it all is based on your insurance company and the drug. You know, they. They'll sometimes they'll pay for a 30-day supply, but boy, sometimes they'll really stick it to you, you know, for certain medications. No, and and to tell you the truth, doctors have no idea what medications cost. Right. 
I don't even think they care. I mean, they do, but I mean, essentially they have no idea how much something costs. We, you know, we get patients all the time like, you're kidding me, that antibiotic is $80? I don't have insurance, I can't pay for that. You know, when, when whatever they're being treated for could be treated with amoxicillin almost just as effectively, you know, that is pennies compared to, to what they're on. So it's, you know, if that's an issue, you know, we will call, we will, you know, and say this, you know, either the patient isn't going to pick up this medicine because they can't afford it, or please call in something that they can afford so we can cure their infection. You know, sometimes, um, you know, we do that with ear drops and eye drops a lot too, because, um, yeah, they're horrendously expensive. All of this pharmacy stuff is so complicated, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's a real big field. Mm -hmm. And I've often wondered why, I mean, doctors that are supposed to be all the knowledge that uh, pharmacy people have, I've often wondered why the doctor doesn't figure out what the is wrong with the patient, and then get the pharmacist to suggest what ought to be a good thing. Well, you know, if you, if you ask a pharmacist, um, they pretty much say, just let the, diet, let the doctor diagnose the patient and let us treat the patient. <laughs> but that doesn't go over too well. No, either. it doesn't. <laughs> So, but yeah, it would it would be a wonderful world if that would happen. <laughs> but but yeah. So next week we have um, Paula Kunkel. It was misrepresented in the news minor today. Um, <laughs> this is not Paula. This is Leah. And Paula will be um, talking with us next week about acupuncture and Oriental medicine. So it should be another interesting um, interesting lecture. So I appreciate your time tonight. And if you'd like updates, there's a little list. Um, Michelle Bartlett will send you an email of what's coming about for summer sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Yay. excellent. <laughs> okay. Thank you for setting this up. Oh. I appreciate it, and thank you thank very you. much. Thank um, you. I go to just one pharmacy. Good girl. <laughs> I carry my list, and I, you know, I. Yay! <laughs> it's just really important, and I oh. appreciate that you stress that so much yeah. because it's made a huge difference when I was traveling. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pharmacist at the West Bank Ranks, uh, Cindy Stranger. Mm -hmm. um, I taught uh, engineering here 40 years uh, here at UAF, and Cindy came as a as a, as a, as a pharmacist, uh -huh. and she went through four years of engineering, and an actually honor student every day. Um, not this summer. Right? No. <laughs> and she <laughs> went back to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um, no, I did last Cindy summer. and I have taken a lot of classes in the winter semester, so, so, yeah. but not yeah. this summer. I know Cindy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. We, uh, it's been a great. I was. I'm very okay. Excited. I will tell her. <laughs> and the people. I, I wanted people to leave this summer with things that they could remember. Okay. I will tell her. Oh, good. I just good. love her to be good. Thank you. Oh, no. <gasps> what is it? Are these the kids? These are my kids. Oh, they're <laughs> yeah, I have to ask a quick question. You said MT and Do you charge for that? So we are supposed to charge. Okay. So MTN services. They make it. Maybe better through Medicare. Kitty. Depending on what you what plan you have. And they, oh, I think I like them. Well, let me tell you my problem. They are, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You like them? Take so many medications. That's super cute. And I go, and can you color her eyes? And the other one is a retired state employee. So, wow. I go through them for 90 days, it's free. Of course, I get all my local. Oh, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> but I just, I. I have never felt comfortable in them on the a pharmacist and try to give her my medication. And I would be glad to pay if I could come in and sit down with you if it's a reasonable rate. That's very okay. So what like the Fred Meyer wants to do is $2 a minute, which I think is oh. But we talk fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but I mean, if you um, 
No, but I, I would. It would be worth being able to because I'm so concerned because my men, I take so many, and I get. Can I take them all at once, or do I have to do it? And, and you know, some at night. Yeah, I get real confused. No, and how do I? An appointment? That would be much okay. appreciated. Okay. So I um. So again, my name is Leah, and yes, I'm a clinical. I'm going to and give I'm you a clinical staff that. So pretty much between both stores. <laughs> okay. And um, I work tomorrow. I try to be All right, another one down. That's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, seven more. Seven more weeks. <laughs> Tuesday was not a very good day, so they just, when they see the sun, they're like, and we're not in bed. But I think this was very good, and it touched a lot of people, so. Yeah. Some familiar faces that I see. Well, I'm just letting them know, I think, a little bit more about what you do and how much of a knowledge base you have. And it's scary to mix medication. And, and, you know, when you run into a lot of people who just say, oh, gosh, they're so busy, I don't want to. Right. Please bother me. That is my job. <laughs> right, right. And that's what you went to school. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's that life saving. So yeah. that's awesome. Well, congratulations. You did a good job. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> this is, I am not a public speaker. You did really well. This is just the kind of crowd that you can just sort of be. Yeah. Yes. I, I know, definitely give feel your opinion and all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it, they aren't a tough, it's not like talking to a group of scientists yeah, or somebody that you know, I, I mean some of these people are scientists mm -hmm. but they're I cannot remember the gentleman's yes, name. Bill Mendenhall, yes. head of engineering at yeah. the University of Americas. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's saying, he was saying um, he goes, I taught Cindy at the other store that you stayed here. He goes yeah. like, civil engineering. Yes, she was a civil <laughs> she taught, he taught my son too in yeah. civil engineering. I mean, yeah. like the Arctic Engineering, yes. Yeah. And he's come to everyone. They come to really, really, yeah. yeah. They go to all the buses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, yeah, very much involved. And I love how they are bold enough to ask questions. You know, just the audience, they feel that comfortable with yeah. you. And so. Because, boy, I got to tell you, earlier, I just wanted to puke my brain out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you did it. You did it. I, you know, I, yeah. yeah. I'm good. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, and I've been telling just, just give me till Tuesday night, and we will have so much more play time. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be awesome. Well, it was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for if your your boss asks. asks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. He's supposed, he and I are supposed to have a coffee because his baseball team beat our baseball team. Oh, Mark Four. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That, that big, that big, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can oh, yeah. so I guess I'll give them a call tomorrow. Yay, and, yeah. Oh, yeah, so we have something. Yeah. So, so how did you have a good time? So, are you going to be on your own? We're thinking the end of July. Uh, yeah, and so I was just yeah, listening to these guys. Make sure. But I know um, Brad has worked at the food plant for um, his pipe fitting and plumbing, so he's had the whole head the day. And I know that I've had both of those because of my internship, so I'm pretty sure we're okay. Yeah. I was thinking about titers that I would just call Dr. Miles and see just to make sure that we're okay. Oh my gosh, yes. Let me know. I know that you You guys did awesome. Thank you. I didn't even hear a peep out of you guys. Yes, they are in my bag, buddy. You can go get them. So his name is Radley, and 
Now, where is he from? He's from China.